can't think of anyone whose career has been of such longevity as yours. Um, there must be. A.E. Matthews, I think, was about 85 when I saw him on the stage in a Moliere in London. And I think he started, well, of course, I, I'll, it'll be 75 the year after next, 75 years. From your first public appearance, which was a My first speech. public appearance, uh, paid. I'm not talking about the amateur work I did. I mean, I, I probably worked the womb, you know. You were working on jokes and... Uh... Well, I was a little wolf cub, and, and my, the Boy Scouts did a, a racist show. It's called a minstrel show. Shocking, shameful. And they needed something in between the acts when they're corking up. So they said, can you do what your father does? And I said, I know, Mom. My father was an amateur cartoonist. He was a very good cartoonist. And uh, he, but he worked for his father who, in the dye works, cleaning and dyeing. It was more dyeing than cleaning in 1935, let me tell you. Nobody got anything cleaned. So he would go out and he would go do banquets for 15 bucks. And uh, they said, can you, I said, I, I don't, Dad. Can, and he taught me how to draw caricatures. I always loved drawing anyway. I thought I was going to be a cartoonist. Not good enough. Not, not, didn't have my own style. Anyway, I did this thing. Between the acts of the minstrels. Yeah, yeah. With huge white sheets of paper and colored chalks. And I had dynamite material. That was the year that Mussolini invaded Ethiopia. So I, I drew this potato and said there was an Irishman called Richard Murphy who couldn't get a job in Ireland. So he went to Italy, and I'm drawing Mussolini's face. He says, and he changed his name from Richard Murphy to Dictator. Wow. Now, was that original from you, or did your <laughs> no, dad help you? No, no, my, I, I, did you come from this stuff? My right? father. <laughs> and so somebody came backstage and said, I'd like you to come to our banquet. I'm Basil Tippett of Tippett Richardson. It's at the round room in Eaton Auditorium, and I'll pay you $15, which was half my father's weekly salary. So I said, yes. How old were you when you first stood up and did Ten. the Mussolini? Ten. Yeah. And your $15 uh, uh, a night performance for the tippet. And I, I did it again and again, because nobody wanted to see a grown man do this stuff. When the little boy, you know, so my father was my coach and shepherd and took me around. And then but you're describing vaudeville. Well, this it, was a vaudeville piece, the drawing. Yeah, the but wit, I was doing mother and politics? son banquets and corporate affairs, you know. And, and somebody came to one of those banquets and said, "Could, would you come to my office, please, and read a script?" And I said, "What's a script?" And I went and I read this thing, and I, she, she said, "Well, that takes it off the paper." I said, "Oh, I'm sorry." And she said, "No, no, you, we want you for this radio series." was before the CBC started in 1936. It was sponsored by the Department of Highways, called the Canadian Radio Commission. And uh, my announcer was Charles Jennings, Peter's father, who was six foot seven. So we had two different mics. And you said it was sponsored by the Canadian Highways? De Ontario Department of Highways. And why was the highways? Ontario Department of Highways yeah. sponsoring? So I had to give a safety message every, every day. As in a different, in an, as a, I, I used an Irish accent the, as opposed to the kid I was, it was called Lonesome Trail, about two boys in the northern Ontario bush. And uh, then I would do the, give the safety message. And I bought a CCM bicycle with my first month's salary. I got $2.50 a broadcast. But not only that, three times a week, but we had to rehearse the other three days <laughs> for nothing. So had you seen vaudeville as a child? Oh, yeah. And you saw vaudeville where, here in Toronto? My father took me to Shays, yeah. I saw a red skeleton, the clown prince, do that wonderful routine where it's the woman getting up in the morning <laughs> and, and also the guy, the guzzler's gin what, commercial. What, what routine, what getting up in the morning? What does this mean? <laughs> adjusting her brassiere, I guess. I don't know. And I saw Mickey Rooney, uh, Joe Ewell Jr., he was called. And what was Shays like? Shays was wonderful. And when he took me to see the great uh, Thurston, the magician, 
we had seats way over on the other side. I guess we couldn't afford them or anyway. And he did his great trick of just being shot out of a cannon right on stage. But where I sat, I could see him slip out of the shell that he, that oh. that he was in. So I was totally disillusioned by the great Thurston. And where was Shays? Shays was where uh, City Hall is now, corner of Bay and Queen. And it was a big vaudeville house, one balcony, two balconies? It was balconies. the vaudeville house. There was a burlesque house called the Casino. I used to go there later when I was in high school. I would take my lunch. To the burlesque house? Just to see the comedians, of course. Of course. You closed your eyes when the comedians <laughs> Phil were Phil Silvers? Stage. And What's what that? comedians did you see at the, uh, at the burlesque house? Phil Silvers, Rags Ragland, and a lot of, a, a guy called Billy Cheese and Crackers Hagen, because you're not allowed to say swear words, so he would say cheese and crackers. And I, all the ba basic burlesque sketches, meet me around the corner in a half an hour, <laughs> all that stuff. And, and the, the ladies, as it were, uh, performed in a group or singly or? They, they performed singly, without a singlet, as we say. Without a <laughs> singlet, as they say. But it was just uh, stripped down to bare essentials rather than the absolute bare. No, well, there, no, no. There More tees than strip tees. Yeah, yeah. There was a, what was the clientele like in the burlesque house? Men in raincoats and high school kids with their lunch. I never saw a woman there. An orchestra in the Except on stage. An orchestra, orchestra was pretty good. Big orchestra, small No, orchestra. four guys. But they work hard. Yeah. Mostly <laughs> in the drum, you know. Right. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and how long would the show be? Who cares? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Six hours if you stayed three times. I oh, I see. It just moved in a continuous oh, yeah, cycle. Yeah. Like a movie, just they just kept it, showing the show. They, yeah, they didn't have movies, but Shays was very special, very but tremendous acts. Like Shoeless Joe Jackson, who used to have have a bicycle made of shoes, and all the wheels, and, and wonderful acts that I can't even tell you. What Bert Wheeler and Woolsey, an old team who did movies as well. And these, this is a circuit. Shays was on the North yeah. American circuit. Keith Orpheum, if you're in. How about that? I can tell you. And do you remember how much it cost to buy a ticket to Shays? 35 cents. Wow. I used to go to the movies for a nickel. I saw Ben Hur when it was silent with Raymond Novaro as Ben Hur. And I got in for a, 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 yeah, a nickel. And later, when I did, it was in Hollywood, we're doing the Dr. Kildare. I worked with Raymond Navarro. He was much shorter than I was. He was just the great hero driving the chariot. It's one of the tragedies for me that Shays, those kind of places were taken down, that we lost those theaters. Yeah. Do you remember, were you around when it was taken down? I don't think I was, no. I think I was away in England somewhere. It was in the 50s, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. That they ripped it down. We lost a number Television of Television did it, you know. Right. Television did it to Spring Thaw. I mean, why, why go to the Spring Thaw when you can see the air fires? Right. Uh, tell me a bit about the, the radio, the pre-CBC radio. Where well, was it? It was in the, in the ever-ready flashlight battery studios on uh, below that Witchwood Hill, which would park with the which would park hill. I used to drive down there with my bicycle, careening into Davenport Road, and once I careened into a cab, and it was all my fault. I just didn't pull the brakes in time, and he was very sweet. He drove me with my wounded steed into the uh, parking lot of the uh, studio, the Ever Ready Flashlight Building, where CRTC was. That was. Yeah, C not the Canadian Radio and Television no, Commission. C I don't know. It was like that anyway. And I dragged my, my bike up to the studio, four floors, and uh, had to get, deliver the safety message while the cast choked on the velvet curtains because they tried to stifle their laughter. 
All the sound was live, no recordings. If you and we wandered through the bush as we did in this series, uh, the sound man, his name is Billy McAlpin, wonderful, inventive guy, and he would uh, punch a bag of uh, salt or cornstarch or something, and then when when we wanted to light a fire, uh, he would crackle cellophane. Cellophane had been invented the year before. It was very new stuff. And uh, rain was uh, dried peas in a sieve. And then we had a wind machine, all cut in notches with the, over a canvas thing that you could go up to a hurricane with it. And this was live to air. Oh, yeah. It, so it was broadcast. The moment you spoke to the mic, it was... That was it. No reruns. Were they ever recorded on... No. And one... I remember one sequence, my mother, actress, I forget, I think her name was Arden Kay, beautiful woman, said uh, she, was, she was going to a, 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 a high fancy dress dinner of some kind, and she asked me as her son, Buzz, would you zip me up? Well, I didn't know what to do, but the talon fastener was invented the year before, I think, and there was Billy McKelp and the sound man in the corner doing this. <laughs> Oh, it was fun. And how many mics in the studio? Two, maybe. So a number of one you One for around. sound. Oh, and one and for effects. One for, for people. So you gather around the mic, pages in hand. Yeah. You'd rehearsed? We rehearsed the day before. Right. <laughs> and Charlie Jennings, six foot seven, I would do the commercial with him. I would stare into his fly because he was so tall. That we, and we had, we must have had two mics for that. Maybe the sound mic was moved over. I don't know. And do you remember the safety commercial? Yeah, don't cross the street without looking twice or something. You know? All wow. the things I didn't, uh, that I ignored. But it, did it, it must have seemed terribly modern to you. The oh, yeah. Mics and tremendous. And, and uh, I would see people, like Lloyd Bachner, for example, was about a year older than me, but he was a star. He was a star of the Vi and Tony show, sponsored by a chocolate drink called Vitone. He and Peggy Loader, who married Teddy Rotterman, they were all, they were, they were the big ones. I was kind of like, and, and uh, Lauren Greenberg had just come down from Ottawa. Lauren Greenberg. Before he Lauren chopped Greenberg. the Berg off his name. Lauren Green was Greenberg. Yeah. And, uh, and he Elwood took the Glover. off to be more or less, was he Jewish? Yeah. So he wanted to lose his I don't know, Jewish he talked him out of it. To fit into the white Anglo-Saxon I guess so. It's like, well, you know, all those Italian actors that, that yeah. I think Tony Franciosa was the first to break the, 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 that bond of, of changing your name. And uh, Elwood Glover was always Elwood Glover from Moose Jaw. He had come in. I, I, I did the commercials on the uh, Big Town with Edward G. Robinson as Fighting Steve Wilson with Claire Trevor as his mate. And I would do, Wuckstray, Wuckstray, get your life boy here. And he would, Alan, oh, he would do his damnedest to make me break up. He was, <laughs> and he was incredible. He, he, he would go on. And do the stock market reports and include members of the royal family in it. <laughs> he and Max Ferguson, he was Max Ferguson's announcer. Oh, um, Alan. <laughs> not Maitland. No, Alan. no. Oh, God, the voice. But he, he and, I, and uh, Max Ferguson were walking by the CB, the Kremlin, you remember that place where they had the big meetings? And, and Max said, hey, you know, you talk a lot, you know, about that, the, the the dolts in charge of the CBC, but you never do anything about it. And he picked up a rock and he heaved it through the window. And he was banned for two weeks. And and two weeks later, he and Max were walking past the same window. And he's, and Max said, yeah, yeah, you did it once, but I bet you wouldn't. He said, fearless. Wow. Oh, the, the, it was full of, they, they claim that he, uh, 
took a hose from his car in the parking lot and ran McPhee. it McPhee. Huh? Alan McPhee. Alan McPhee. Alan McPhee. We should not forget that man. He Sorry, ran, I interrupted He ran, you. ran the hose from his car into Studio G because he didn't like the guy, who, the producer. And he called it Vacuum Land. Yes. And, and the, he, ne he, never, he never called it the CBC, he called it the Canadian Radio Commission, which is what I worked for in 1936.